In 1995, the Cleveland Browns announced that they would be relocating to Baltimore. They eventually became the Ravens and went on to be a solid franchise and win multiple Super Bowls. The NFL, however, promised the city of Cleveland that the Browns would return by the year 1999. That is exactly what happened, and for the past 20 years, the Browns have been one of, if not the worst franchise in sports history. During this period, the Browns have had 30 quarterbacks who have started at least one game. So, to honor the anniversary of the Browns' return, I have ranked every starting quarterback in Browns' recent history. Normally, lists like this start from the bottom and work their way up, but come on, this is Cleveland we're talking about. The fun is in seeing their failure. So, Without further ado, I present every Browns starting quarterback from January 1999 to January 2019, ranked from best to worst. At number one, we have the current Browns quarterback, Baker Mayfield. Mayfield got out to a mediocre start to the season, but after head coach Hugh Jackson and offensive coordinator Todd Haley were fired midway through the season, Mayfield showed heavy improvement and finished the season completing 64% for 3,725 yards, 27 touchdowns, and 14 interceptions. The 27 passing touchdowns is notable for being a NFL record for a rookie. Only complaint. He's a little Kirk Cousins-esque in his consistency. And what I mean by that is a lot of his stats are padded by touchdowns or huge games when it's garbage time and the game is already over, or against terrible teams that have terrible defenses. So, for example, against teams that finished with a winning record, Mayfield only completed about 59% with 10 touchdowns and 11 interceptions. Furthermore, just like the Kirk Cousins-led Vikings, the Browns were only able to win one game against a team that finished with a winning record. With that being said, Kirk Cousins' caliber is still way better than anything else the Browns have had. So my hat is off to you, Mayfield. You are truly the best of the worst. In 2007, Derek Anderson led the Browns to their best record since being revived in 1999 at 10-6. and six. Anderson is also the only player on this list to make Pro Bowl with the Browns. Nowadays, his stats from that season aren't anything special. 56 completion percentage, 3,787 yards, 32 total touchdowns and 19 interceptions. But at the time, it worked. Unfortunately, the Browns were unable to make playoffs that year, and Anderson quickly regressed, throwing 50% with 9 touchdowns and 8 picks the next year in 2008, and then an abysmal 44%, 3 touchdowns and 10 picks in 2009. Anderson should serve as a learning point for Mayfield and the current Browns. Don't get complacent after showing promise for one season, because you might just fall off the face of the earth. Still though, Anderson in 2007 is enough to earn him the number two spot. Brian Hoyer is definitely not starting quarterback material. He does, however, have one key asset that none of the other quarterbacks on this list have. He has a winning record as the Browns' starting quarterback with 10 wins and 6 losses. Other than that, he's pretty unremarkable. Below 60 completion percentage, about average yardage, 17 touchdowns and 16 picks. Brian Hoyer is actually about an average talent for a backup in the NFL, which says something about the Browns when an average backup is their third best in 20 years. Cody Kessler really wasn't that bad as a Browns quarterback. In 2016, he completed about 66% for 1,380 yards, 6 touchdowns, and 2 picks. Only one problem. That was spread out over 8 games that he started and he didn't win a single one of them. This was Hugh Jackson's first season as the Browns head coach. And I think he ruined Cody Kessler the same way he was going to ruin Baker Mayfield had he not been fired midway through the season. Kessler, along with Tyrod Taylor, is perhaps the most tragic story on this list. Maybe if he'd been given a halfway decent team with a competent coaching staff, perhaps he could have amounted to something. 
But as it stands now, Kessler is just another mediocre backup. At number five, we have perhaps the most famous journeyman, Josh McCown. McCown actually had a pretty solid season in Cleveland in 2015. He started about half the games, threw for 2,109 yards at a 64 completion percentage with 13 touchdowns and four interceptions. As you might expect, though, this did not equate to wins, and the Browns finished with a terrible 3-13 record. Bad went to worse for Josh McCown and the Cleveland Browns as Hugh Jackson was brought in to be the head coach next season. And as seemingly every quarterback does, Josh McCown regressed massively under Hugh Jackson. He only started three games and threw for a measly 55% with six touchdowns and six picks in 2016 before being released by the Browns in the 2017 offseason. The original Browns quarterback and still one of the best. Tim Couch is number six. Couch is notable for giving the Browns their only winning season other than 2007, and unlike that season, under Couch, the Browns actually made their one and only trip to the playoffs over the 20 year span, and of course, they lost to Pittsburgh in the wild card round. Couch was the starting quarterback for the Browns for five years on and off, and during that time, he was almost good. He averaged a little over 2,000 yards a season a 60 completion percentage, 66 total touchdowns, and 67 interceptions. Couch was the number one pick in the 1999 NFL Draft, and unfortunately, he never lived up to those expectations. Kelly Holcomb was never intended to be the Browns' starting quarterback. He was brought in to be Tim Couch's backup. Although Couch was the starting quarterback for most of the season, Holcomb actually wound up being the starter for their playoff game. Holcomb had a pretty solid year, debatably even better than Tim Couch, and although the Browns didn't win their playoff game, Holcomb still had a really strong performance. That year, he completed 61% for 1,219 yards, 11 touchdowns, and 5 picks. The next year, he and Tim Couch started half the games, and neither of them performed well. Holcomb only threw for 10 touchdowns and 11 picks that season. In 2004, Holcomb started two games for the Browns and actually wasn't that bad, but the Browns decided to stick with Jeff Garcia as their starting quarterback instead. Speaking of Jeff Garcia, he finds himself at number 8. Garcia was very hot and cold during the 10 games that he started for the Browns in 2004. He had a few solid games against Cincinnati and Baltimore, but he had a few terrible games as well, most notably the game against the Cowboys, where he completed 8 out of 27 passes for 71 yards, 0 touchdowns, and 3 interceptions. Garcia finished the season completing 57% for 12 total touchdowns and 9 picks. What's interesting is that Garcia's stats and overall play with the 49ers, Bucks, and Eagles really aren't that bad. It's a testament to how dysfunctional Cleveland and Detroit are, that they're the only two cities where he couldn't find hardly any success. Most people don't remember Jason Campbell, but if they do, they most likely remember him as a Redskins quarterback. However, near the end of his career, he played one season in Cleveland. He was brought on to be the backup for Brandon Whedon, but due to injuries and poor play, Campbell became the starter in Week 8. Things were looking good after his first two games. He threw for 293 yards and two touchdowns with no picks and a six-point loss to the Chiefs and 293 yards and three touchdowns and a win against the Ravens. He was even named AFC Offensive Player of the Week. Sadly, the rest of the season was a failure and Campbell didn't win another game with the Browns. He finished with a 57 completion percentage, 2,015 yards, 11 touchdowns, and eight picks. Flashback to the 2010 NFL Draft. The Browns, like most years, are in the market for a new quarterback. Only problem, there was a poor selection that year. Cleveland decided to wait until the third round, where there they drafted Colt McCoy from the University of Texas, who had been a Heisman finalist twice, and at the time was the winningest quarterback in NCAA FBS history. The plan was to let McCoy develop for a year as a backup. This derailed quickly when injuries to Jake Delholm and Seneca Wallace forced McCoy into action. McCoy's rookie year didn't go well. In eight games, he only scored seven touchdowns and threw nine interceptions. The Browns weren't ready to quit on him, though, 
and started him for the majority of the 2011 season. McCoy improved his touchdown-to-interception ratio, but regressed in almost every other stat, including completion percentage and yards per attempt. They kept him on as a backup in 2012, before letting him move on to his permanent job, a backup in Washington. Robert Griffin III showed so much promise his rookie season with Washington. He made Pro Bowl and won Offensive Rookie of the Year. Due to injuries and issues with the coaching staff, RG3 never captured the same quality he had his rookie year. After Kirk Cousins replaced him as the starter, you like that? You like that? RG3 was forced to play safety on the Redskins scout team. And in March of 2016, the Redskins released the former Heisman Trophy winner and second overall pick. 17 days later, every quarterback's favorite coach, Hugh Jackson, signed RG3 to the Browns. He was the starter going into the 2016 season. In what was quickly becoming a reoccurring theme in RG3's career, he was injured week one and missed most of the season. He was able to come back at the end of the year, and on the bright side, he managed to get the Browns their one win of that season. All in all, though, RG3 was below average in Cleveland. The Browns released him that offseason, figuring they would be better in 2017 without him. But considering he won their one game in 2016 and they didn't win any in 2017, they were probably wrong about that one. At number 12, we have another first-round pick, Brady Quinn. Unlike most Browns quarterbacks, Brady Quinn was given a full year to develop as the backup behind the Pro Bowl Derek Anderson and the team that would finish 10-6. and It seemed like the perfect situation. In 2008, the team got out to a disappointing 3-5 and start. Anderson got benched in favor of Quinn, who was unimpressive to say the least. 51 completion percentage, 2 touchdowns, 2 picks, not a lot of yards, and he was injured after three games, missed the rest of the season. In 2009, he beat out Anderson for the starting job, but played equally as pathetic as the year before, and in game three against the Ravens, he was replaced by Anderson. Quinn was able to win the starting job back later on in the season, but after a few games, he was injured yet again, and in the offseason, he was traded to the Broncos for Peyton Hillis. Trent Dilfer was drafted 6th overall in 1994 by the Buccaneers. He wasn't very good with them, or his second team, Baltimore. He spent a couple of years as a backup in Seattle before playing for the Browns for one season in 2005. The idea was that Dilfer was going to be the starter and mentor the rookie Charlie Fry before eventually working Fry into the starting job. Due to a dysfunctional coaching staff, this failed miserably. Dilfer finished that season with a 60 completion percentage, 2,321 yards, 11 touchdowns, and 12 picks in 11 games. Seneca Wallace was also a backup for the Seahawks at the same time as Trent Dilfer. Wallace wasn't half bad, so he was brought on to complete the Browns quarterback carousel with Jake Delholm and Colt McCoy. Delholm got hurt week one, which forced Wallace into action. He was below average, but not terrible. 63 completion percentage, 4 touchdowns, 2 picks, only about 150 yards per game over 4 starts. He got hurt and didn't play much the rest of the season. He actually started a couple of games the next year, but regressed in almost every stat. 12 points lower completion percentage, less yards, and more turnovers than touchdowns. Although Tim Couch started almost every game in 1999, Ty Detmer was actually the starter week one, which technically makes him the first quarterback of the revived Cleveland Browns. Coincidentally, he also started the last game of 1999 due to an injury to Tim Couch. In his one season and two starts with the Browns, Detmer was extremely mediocre, with a 52 completion percentage, 548 yards, four touchdowns, and two interceptions. He also lost both games where he started. With that being said, it should also be noted that Detmer is the last person on this list to throw for more touchdowns than interceptions. Thad Lewis started one game for the Browns. It was the last game of 2012 against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Lewis completed 22 out of 32 passes for 204 yards, one touchdown, and one pick in a 24-10 loss. He is without question 
the most forgettable quarterback on this list. Everybody knew going into the 2012 draft that Oklahoma State's Brandon Whedon was a very high-risk, high-reward prospect. Most teams didn't think he was worth a first-round pick. But, as we all know, the Browns are not most teams. His rookie season started off very inconsistent. One week, he would barely be able to complete a pass and throw four picks. The next, he would complete 26 out of 37 for 322 yards, two touchdowns, and no picks. Eventually, though, he settled into his below-average ways. Whedon started 20 games over two years with the Browns. His completion percentage was in the mid-50s and got worse as time went on. He threw 23 touchdowns and 26 interceptions. He did have a decent amount of yards, though, averaging about 250 a game and breaking the Browns' rookie record for passing yards in a season. The one you've all been waiting for, number 18, Johnny Football. In two years with the Browns, Manziel started eight games and only won one of them. His play on the field wasn't good. 57 completion percentage with seven touchdowns and seven picks, with another touchdown on the ground. What really gains Manziel those additional negative points is everything that happened off the field. Manziel made a mockery of an organization that was already a joke. The Browns showed a rare display of competency when they had the foresight to trade away one of the biggest running back flops in history, Trent Richardson, to the Colts for a first round pick. The Browns then went back to their usual selves by using that pick to draft Johnny Manziel, creating the most infamous lose-lose trade in NFL history. Remember how I said Whedon was a high-risk, high-reward pick? Well, Manziel is perhaps the highest-risk player in NFL history. And in typical Browns fashion, it completely failed. Manziel would find himself in and out of rehab, indicted for domestic violence after allegedly threatening to kill his girlfriend and then kill himself, using disguises to go to clubs without the Browns finding out, and his own father even said, quote, he's a druggie. It's no secret that he's a druggie. Hopefully he doesn't die before he comes to his senses. I mean, I hate to say it, but I hope he goes to jail. I mean, that would be the best place for him. I'm doing my job, and I'm going to move on. If I have to bury him, I'll bury him. End quote. With all of that being said, Manziel perhaps did more damage to the Browns organization than any other quarterback on this list. We all wanted Tyrod Taylor to succeed. He wasn't anything special in Buffalo, but he was getting the job done. He even made Pro Bowl once and got to the playoffs. Being sent to the Browns with every quarterback's favorite coach, Hugh Jackson, seemed like a death sentence, and that's basically what it was. He completed less than 50%, only about 150 yards per game, two touchdowns, two interceptions. Although he did do a decent job running the ball, averaging about 8 yards per carry and scoring another touchdown. The lethal injection of Tyrod Taylor's career with the Browns came in week 3 against the Jets, where once again he struggled. He got hurt, Mayfield came in, and led the Browns to their first win in over a year. Taylor never started after that, and barring any injuries, will likely never start again for the Browns. The only other noteworthy thing about Tyrod Taylor is that he was able to end the massive losing streak that the Browns had, and in typical Cleveland fashion, he ended it with a tie. Of course. This is where things start to get really bad. Charlie Fry got his first opportunity to start for the Browns in 2005 against the Jaguars. He actually looked pretty good, and actually set a single-game Browns record for quarterback rating. It was all downhill from there. In 2005, 2006, and 2007, his best stat was his completion percentage, which was in the low 60s. Only problem was that his average yards per attempt was about 6, and he threw for 14 touchdowns and 23 interceptions. He was able to tack on a few more touchdowns on the ground, but not enough to make an impact. In 2007, Fry started the first game against Pittsburgh and played poorly. He got benched for Derek Anderson, 
who went on to have a great season. So yeah, the way Charlie Fry helped his team the most was by getting benched. At number 21, we have Austin Davis. Davis played in three games for the Browns and started two of them. It was miserable. 59 completion percentage, 5.8 yards per attempt, one touchdown, three picks, and they lost every game he played in. He even got benched for Johnny Manziel. Similar to Austin Davis, Connor Shaw started one game the year prior in 2014. Shaw wasn't even supposed to be on the team, but due to injuries to Manziel and Hoyer, Shaw was promoted from the practice squad. In his one game against the Ravens, Shaw completed 14 out of 28 for 177 yards, zero touchdowns, and one interception. As is the case so many times with older and younger brothers, younger brother Luke never managed to have the same success as his older brother Josh. Which is saying something, considering Josh is most well known for bouncing from team to team. The first team Luke McCown played for was the Browns. He was only in Cleveland for one season, and was expected to ride the bench behind Kelly Holcomb and Jeff Garcia. But of course, what can go wrong in Cleveland will go wrong. McCown wound up starting four games. During those games, he completed 49% for about 125 yards per game, four touchdowns, seven picks, and zero wins. When the Browns drafted Colt McCoy, they knew he was a project. They wanted him to sit and learn from a veteran for a year or two. That veteran wound up being Jake Delholm. Delholm had a decent career with the Carolina Panthers, but completely fell off the face of the earth his last season in Charlotte and eventually got cut. The Browns were hoping that they could get at least a year of mediocre play out of him, but even that didn't happen. Delholm got hurt week one and allegedly was never 100% for the rest of the season and had to play through pain. This resulted in below average stats around the board, with the exception of two atrocious stats. Two touchdowns and seven interceptions. Keep in mind, those two touchdowns were spread out over five games that he played in. Kevin Hogan played as a backup for two years for the Browns and head coach Hugh Jackson. He performed about as well as all the other quarterbacks that Hugh Jackson coached. However, Midway through the 2017 season, Deshaun Kaiser was struggling, and Hugh Jackson decided to bench him halfway through the game against the Jets. Kevin Hogan came in and, surprisingly, did really good, completing 16 of 19 for 194 yards, two touchdowns, and one pick. This led to Hogan being named the starter for next week's game against the Texans. It didn't go well. Hogan completed a little over half of his passes for 140 yards, one touchdown, and three picks in a blowout loss. To make things worse, Hogan was also injured that game and was inactive for three weeks afterwards. The 2017 NFL Draft had several big-name quarterbacks that all seemed to have loads of potential. This included Mitch Trubisky, Deshaun Watson, and Patrick Mahomes. Fox Sports analyst Joel Klatt shocked the world when he announced that, in his opinion, Deshaun Kaiser was the best quarterback in the entire draft. 31 of the NFL teams thought he was crazy, but Hugh Jackson and the Cleveland Browns appeared to have a similar opinion. Cleveland needed a quarterback, and they had the first overall pick. However, they decided that Miles Garrett was simply too good to pass on decided to take him first and get a quarterback in the second round. That quarterback wound up being Deshaun Kaiser, who started 15 games the next season. What is there to say about Deshaun Kaiser that hasn't been said already? 53 completion percentage, 6.1 yards per attempt, 11 touchdowns to 22 interceptions, and 0-15 as a starter. He was mediocre at running the ball, but even then, he had more lost fumbles than rushing touchdowns. He had one of the all-time worst seasons out of any quarterback to start that many games, and was undoubtedly the worst quarterback that year. This is the point on the list 
where there basically isn't anything positive I can say. Before he was a Super Bowl winning coach for the Philadelphia Eagles, Doug Peterson was a Browns starting quarterback. In 2000, Peterson started 8 games, and during those 8 games, he scored a grand total of 2 touchdowns. He also averaged an abysmal 5 yards per attempt and only completed 56%. The cherry on the Sunday is the 8 interceptions that he also threw. During the same 2000 season, backup quarterback Spurgeon Wynn played in 7 games and managed to be the starter for one of them. That one game would wind up being a 48 to nothing loss to the Jacksonville Jaguars. Overall, Wynn finished his one season with Cleveland with a 41 completion percentage, 167 yards, no touchdowns, but surprisingly, only one interception. 2008 was one of, if not the most disappointing season in Brown's history. The team won 10 games the year before, and showed quite a bit of potential. As we all know though, that came crashing down. Deep into the season, both Derek Anderson and Brady Quinn were out with injuries, which forced the third string quarterback, Ken Dorsey, into the starting spot. I feel bad for the guy just looking at his stats. 47 completion percentage, 4.1 yards per attempt, 0 touchdowns, 7 interceptions, and a 0-3 record. How was someone this bad even an option? They would have been better off just having their running backs and receivers take the ball and wildcat every play. That is how dysfunctional the Cleveland Browns are. Their best choice would have been abandoning the passing game entirely. How can it get any worse than Ken Dorsey? Ken Dorsey's backup, Bruce Gradkowski, started the last game of the 2008 season because Dorsey got hurt. In his one game, Gradkowski completed 7 out of 21 passes for 26 yards, 0 touchdowns, and 3 interceptions. That is 1.2 yards per attempt and a 33 completion percentage. The Browns should have just had Gradkowski hand the ball off all game and only throw like five times. They would have been better off if he had just thrown the ball into the dirt every time he passed. But no, instead, they just insist on shooting themselves in the foot over and over again. Gradkowski, my friend, you are truly the worst of the worst.